March 3rd, 2018. I'll give the Hebrew date as we go live. We're only going to do live on Facebook Live today. I'll explain in a moment. But let's get that going. Happy Sabbath. Greetings to those of you watching the Sabbath service page of Facebook Live for this 16th day of the 12th month for the Sabbath service a.m. to the United States, p.m. to the United Kingdom, a.m. to the U.S., p.m. to the U.K. And as I mentioned last night on the Bible study, the Friday night Bible study, the Sabbath service for this morning would continue, still be the 16th day of the 12th month, as it was last night, Friday night. That's on God's sacred calendar, on the Hebrew calendar, the date since sunset last night has and will remain, has been and will remain to be the 16th day of the 12th month until sunset tonight. But on man's calendar, on the pagan Roman calendar, as we mentioned in Bible study last night, it was the second day of March, but this morning, Saturday morning on the Roman calendar, it's the third day, the third day of March, 2018. All right, just to have a point of reference, we have to, we have to, uh, interact with the pagan Roman calendar because that's the calendar the world goes by and say you know we you last night we weren't able to have the camera on tonight that's working or I'm sorry this morning still feels like night in a way for me I was up very late last night but uh, I'm glad to have the camera so you can see my ugly mug <laughs> well not for that purpose so you can see my ugly mug but it just for me it's easier to talk to you when I got the camera where I feel like you can see me and any gestures I might make, hopefully not too many, not excessively so, uh, it's just easier for me to talk to you. If I'm thinking that you're sitting there and you see my ugly mug and you see my gestures, then it is to do it radio style that's just microphone only. Now, of course, now I know some of you listen via podcast, so that is audio only, and I do try to keep that in mind as we're talking and doing things. But happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm just going to introduce some some things we're going to play this morning. Some radio broadcast by God's end-time apostle, Herbert W. Armstrong, where he is talking about Russia in prophecy. Russia's been in the news lately. This week was some, and I covered, I showed the video from Thursday's news, how President Putin of Russia was announcing that they have new missiles that are invincible. They're able to do stealth-type flying. To a, They have ways of avoiding air defense system. He said they can penetrate. And as he showed an animation of that, and his, as many commentators and reporters pointed out, he was doing a rally cry to Russians, come home, prepare for war. We're going to, you know, we got big plans in mind. However, I showed scriptures last night from Isaiah 10 that shows how it won't be Russia that God uses to punish modern day Joseph, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States. He says he's going to use the modern day Assyrians, which is Germany and Austria, those people. And so, since Russia has all these missiles, and Russia's a big enemy, you know, of Germany, Germany an enemy of, you know, long, been long enemies, um, is it possible, friends, that God will allow something or even help cause something so that, uh, well, all he really would have to do is just allow it, because Russia supplies a lot of the oil and gas for Europe. And let's say Russia raised its prices to pay for all this war stuff and Europe was hurt by it and they decide, we've had it with you, Russia. We're coming in and that's ours. We're going to take it. And or, or something happens where, just like Hitler, I've got a video I'm going to be showing Sunday night on World Watch that I plan to show Sunday night on World Watch where a reporter from the time of World War II is telling first person how he was in Germany after a certain fire reporting on it and he was welcome a, re a welcome reporter 
and Hitler dropped back and walked with that reporter for a couple of minutes long enough to say to the reporter that Hitler hoped that fire could be proved to be or at least be blamed on Russia so that Germany would have a good excuse for going in and attacking Russia. So they're long enemies and <clears throat> and and of course big enemies during World War II. So during round three as round three is about to go off Germany as the head of a United States of Europe may well go in and take all these missiles Mr. Putin that you just announced in your animation that you have already aimed at a hundred over 131 major cities of the United States all of the United States military facilities and showed a map in your animation of Russia of Florida of with many similarities to Florida. We showed that last night. From Thursday's news, we were off Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday this week on World Watch because of some software problems that I'm still wrestling with. We got the, uh, the video back. We're not able to be on Sabbath.tv channel this morning, live streaming, because uh, the audio into that device is not functioning, and I... And I've missed something up in the software, and I'm going to have to get either some pro help or figure it out Sunday and fix it before Sunday night. But it looks like we're, we've got a green light on Facebook Live on that. That encoder is working. <clears throat> it's audio, and it picks up this video. So uh, we're streaming live on Facebook Live okay, but... Uh, Wednesday and Thursday night for World Watch, we weren't able to do that this week. But Thursday's news, I showed it last night during the Friday night Bible study. That's, I, I think that's in a working archive. i got to go back and check that. I got a note from Vimeo saying, at least on one of my uh, Wi-Fi, small Wi-Fi mobile devices, <clears throat> it wouldn't play on there last night. So I'm saying, uh-oh. All right, so we'll check that. But in last night's Bible study, we showed the news from Thursday with Putin uh, doing a rally cry to uh, summon Russia to be prepared for war. But I'm going to show you, uh, or <clears throat> at least you'll hear these radio programs this morning given by God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong explaining from prophecy it will not be Russia that attacks the United States, although they'll cause a lot of fear and concern, and they, it may be their military weaponry, though, that a United States of Europe, under the lead of Assyria, modern-day Assyria, Germany, Austria, perhaps one of the descendants, one of the sons of, one of the former, well, by sons, I mean, you know, sons, grandson, of one of the former emperors of the Holy Roman Empire that's to be revised one final time for its seventh and final time with a new head the Bible calls the beast referenced in Revelation 17 verse 10 as the seventh and final king of the seven kings of Revelation 17 verse 10 a verse which says there are seven kings five are fallen through, uh, let's see, do I have that picture? No, I'm not able to put that picture up here this morning, but it says five are fallen and one is. Now, even the one is is now fallen because as the Apostle John wrote from the Isle of Patmos in about 90 AD, when he said one is, he was doing a future tense thing. Uh, future perfect tense, speaking as if it were in the present moment, but a present moment to be at a time in the future. I think they call that future perfect in grammar. Saying one is, but that one is hadn't even been born yet. Neither, neither had the five that are fallen. They hadn't even been born yet either back in 90 AD, because the first of those, Justinian, began his rule in 554 A.D., uh, so at least 400, more than 400 years after 
The Apostle Paul wrote that prophecy for Revelation 17, verse 10. There are seven kings. None of those seven kings had even been born. The first of them began his reign more than 400 years later in 554 when Justinian restored the imperial form of government for the Roman Empire instead of a republican form, an imperial form, dictator style, with appointments by the Pope because that imperial form of the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire with a union of church and state. That's why the United States government is so against church and state. They don't want religion ruling over the government as church and state in Europe under the Roman Holy Roman Empire had the Pope crowning the emperors and kings of the Roman Empire making it the Holy Roman Empire. They, kings and emperors, emperors and kings, served under and, 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 um, and subject to the demise of the, of the Pope, uh, the, or the will of the Pope. And uh, that's going to happen again during the seventh and final revival of a Holy Roman Empire. But Justinian was the first of the seven kings of Revelation 17, verse 10. He was the first of the five that are fallen, where those five, their dynasties, had a continuous 1260-year reign from 554 with Justinian restoring the, the imperial, imperial form of government in the Roman Empire all the way through Napoleon who during the Battle of 1814 <clears throat> he that he lost lost big time um, ending that 1260 year continuous reign. Now some of you are familiar with the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 that was a comeback effort by Napoleon and he he lost the comeback effort so the battle that he lost the year before in 1814 remains as the battle that ended the continuous reign of the Holy Roman Empire put the Holy Roman Empire into the abyss into the pit you know didn't completely destroy it just put it kind of down and under for over a hundred years from 1814 until the sixth king the one that's referenced as the one that is became the one that is in 1935 the fall of 1935 after Mussolini had secured a concordant a writing from the Vatican and then conquered Ethiopia he pronounced himself as the new Il Duce, the new Julius Caesar, having revived the Holy Roman Empire. And he stayed over, remained over that until, until his demise, until he was shot in the belly on April 28, 1945, almost 10 years later, the spring of 1945. So from the fall of 1935 to the spring of 1945, that would have been about nine and a half years that Mussolini had his reign. Same length of time that Napoleon was in office. Napoleon was in there from the fall of 1804 to the spring. Let me turn off this heater that just popped on behind me because I it's making a noise. I know the microphone's going to pick up. But Napoleon reigned from the fall of 1804 to the spring of 1814 when he lost that battle of 1814 in the spring of 1814. So that was nine and a half years for Napoleon. Mussolini had the same length of his reign, nine and a half years, fall of 1935 to the spring of 1945. All right, history is important for us, friends, because history proves the Bible uh, and relates to the Bible and helps prove it and also helps to show who God's servants are because that was revealed to us that Mussolini was the sixth king, the first to announce it. Every a lot of other people picked up on it, were able to pick up on it after God revealed it through his end-time apostle, Herbert Armstrong. But once God reveals something and you can prove it from the Bible, well, this squares with the Bible. And you can see it. Well, yeah, you got it, but who'd you get it from? 
God tells us to remember. In Revelation 3, verse 3, he tells us to remember by and through whom we heard certain truths. Let me read that so that I'm, so I'm not paraphrasing it too roughly. Uh, and in Revelation 3, verse 3, if you want to go there with me, we'll go to Mr. Armstrong and Russia and prophecy in just a moment. But uh, Revelation 3, verse 3, Remember how you received and heard and hold fast and repent. Now he's saying, therefore, referring back to the Sardis era, but this refers to all brethren of all eras, you know, and the eras that come after Sardis, when he says, remember how you received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. Now, in, especially in the case of Sardis, he's saying, and repent, and he's saying, therefore, referring back to the two verses before verse 3 of Revelation 3, because, because, uh, at the end of verse 1, God is saying to Sardis, I know your works, that you have a name that livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. And so, for I have not found your works perfect before God. And that's why he says, therefore, remember therefore how you received and heard and hold fast and repent. So, um, there, there were some... Um, Men whom God used, who did good, uh, who brought truth along, which was helpful to God's end-time apostle, who, through whom God began and started the sixth era, the Philadelphia era of the Church of God, the body of Christ, the forming part of the temple of God. And he, God used that to bring along his end-time apostle, Herbert W. Armstrong, who proved himself to be extremely faithful, especially when it came to truths about how the Sabbath requires keeping not only the weekly Sabbath, but the annual Sabbaths as well. And where Sardis, uh, the people of Sardis and the leadership of Sardis and the membership of Sardis uh, <clears throat> didn't prove faithful on that. God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong, even though the first seven years after learning that we should keep the annual Sabbath, Mr. Armstrong, together with his wife, kept them alone for seven years. Nobody else keeping them with the under, with you know, with God's spirit and keeping them at that time, from 1926, 1927 through 1933, when finally God opened up, began to open up the door for the Philadelphia era with 19 people who began keeping the feast with Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong thereafter. All right, now let's get to Mr. Armstrong this morning. Again, this is the 16th day of the 12th month. I put a calendar that I developed for the back of a business card, business card size calendar last night, showing that the, the uh, <clears throat> Passover memorial is just, 16th day of the 12th month, we're less than a month away on God's calendar, uh, less than four weeks away from the Passover memorial now, because that's on the evening uh, of the 14th of the first month, and uh, when I say evening, that's evening comes before the morning, right after sunset, soon after sunset on the 14th, so that works out to be March 29 this year uh, on the Roman calendar. And Passover continues into the next day, March 30. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so the, be prepared. March 29, that's the Passover memorial. Be sure you're, if you're going to do it at home, be sure you go ahead and line up your, uh, your, your unleavened bread. If you're going to get matzos or something like that, better try to start looking for them in the stores as soon as they come out because as we get close to Passover, within a few days of Passover, they often disappear from the store shelves because not only do we do that, the Jewish people are using the unleavened bread and that just means that stuff gets grabbed up come Passover time. So, uh, you know, you can make your own, but it's kind of nice just to be able to buy those off the shelf, especially if you're doing Passover at home, you got your unleavened bread crackers, you can 
do the bread breaking with and that just works kind of nice. Go ahead and get your matzahs lined up. As soon as you see them on the shelves, grab, grab yourself some. Uh, just a reminder, that's just a suggestion for you. And uh, But uh, now what we were saying about uh, the, the seven kings, the one that is was Mussolini. He came 1935, ten years later, nine and a half years later, April 28, 1945, He's out of the picture. They shot him in the belly and they hung him upside down along with his mistress and comrades. He, they shot all them in the belly too and hung them all upside down from the canopy of an SO gasoline station in Italy. 1945. So uh, the one is, has come, has gone. We're now in the next part of Revelation 17.10 where it says uh, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, and when he comes, he shall continue a little time. Well, I'm, let me read that to you. So, so, if I didn't do the words exactly like it says, you won't say, "Oh, you messed that up." Well, it says that, and there are seven kings; five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. So, you know, the other is not yet come. That's he's yet to come. He's not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And so uh, we're watching for that one, that seventh king, that final one. There's seven kings. That's it. Six have come and gone. The five that are, have come and fallen as one continuous 1260-year reign of their dynasties, Justinian through Napoleon. It was Justinian, Charlemagne, Otto the Great, Charles V, and Napoleon, boom, the five, the five that are fallen, then Mussolini, the one that is, as John said it back in 90 A.D., future perfect tense. He'll be is in the future. Well, that time of the future has come and is now past tense, kind of a past perfect tense, I guess you might say, because the one is, was. He was is between 1935 and 1945 now he's history he's he joins the five that are fallen and the part of Revelation 17 10 that is the future prophetic part now one is was a future prophetic prophetic part when John spoke it in 1990 I'm sorry back in 90 AD it was a future prophecy until 1935 when the one is came into power, announcing himself as the new Il Duce, the new Julius Caesar, having revived the Holy Roman Empire, which he did as the sixth king. And so now the other who's not yet come, we're watching for him. Uh, and uh, he's called a beast in the Bible. He works with a woman. A woman in prophecy pictures a church, and in this case, a false church who rides the woman, who controls uh, the woman rides the beast, I meant to say. Uh, and the rider of a beast controls that beast, holds the reins. And so the Vatican, the Pope, the, who the Bible calls the false prophet, will control that very powerful beast who will very likely punch out their old enemy, Russia. Let me just ask you, what do you think? You think Germany will probably go into a clash with Russia just before um, Germany as the United, as the leader of the United States of Europe, you know, a form of the United States of Europe, uh, the ten nations that join together give their power to one dictator, one new emperor, who will revive the Holy Roman Empire as an emperor over that empire. The Bible calls it a, him a beast, and so that great power being an old enemy of Russia, and Russia has all these missiles already pointed, already accurate, ready to fly, invincible, as President Putin put it on Thursday. We're going to mention the weather in the Northeast from today's news real quickly before we go to Mr. Armstrong, Russia and prophecy, because devastating in the Northeast. Yeah, we're aware of that. We're going to make mention of it because... It'll be good for brethren if all of us are praying for our fellow brethren on the Northeast this morning. But let me finish this comment about Putin and Russia. 
with President Putin making all of those in comments about their invincible missiles pointed already at the United States and showing a map with many similarities to Florida. And I read you some news reports last night that pointed out why Putin, why Russia would want to focus on Florida because we have a lot of underground missile, uh, underground uh, um, bunkers in Florida, some part of the Maro Lago facility, so President Trump could go down and those, and, uh, and one that John Kennedy used off, off of uh, NASA there, and one other one, part of a military facility in Florida. And there's a, there's a major military intelligence operational center related to th things overseas in Florida. And so, of course, Russia would want to attack those strategic points. And, and then 131 major cities in the United States, Putin announced they've got missiles already aimed at them. So, and what was he doing? Are we, you know, it's already obvious there's conflict between the United States, the West, and Russia. And his, he's not saying we're gonna, we want to start active war with you at the moment. And his announcement really wasn't for us as much as it was a rallying cry for fellow Russians around the world to come home, prepare for war. That's what many analysts are saying. Uh, but Russia won't do it. You're going to hear God's End Time Apostle Herbert Armstrong explain in this radio broadcast. We've got a series of them. I'm going to play at least one for you this morning. And maybe I'll come back this afternoon and play some more of those Russia in prophecy. Because uh, it's good for us to be familiar with this, especially right now, since Thursday, President Putin announcing, scaring people, uh, those who, you know, who might be scared from it anymore, that Russia's got missiles aimed, aimed at us. I remember as a little kid when Khrushchev used to, uh, used to say that kind of thing, you know, and the family would talk about, hey, can we... Can we build a bomb shelter? You know, and at that time, people were, it shook people up. We were really concerned and frightened about it. Now people are like, well, just, that's just part of what you have to expect. We've got all these all this nuclear weaponry that can blow up the entire world several times over, stockpiled. And people are like, oh, well, that's just part of life today. Um, but maybe some people will be concerned about it. Maybe not. But if, um, if we had real concern... You know, the United States would be uh, wanting to maybe, maybe be more active against it. But we'll tell you, like, grain of salt, that's just political talk. But it's not. It's real. They got that. They have that kind of weaponry. And are we going to do something to beef up our defenses? Probably not. Uh, and will Germany... Will something... Will some event happen that will cause Germany to knock out Russia and take all those missiles and Germany fire them off and send them into the United States. Because as God's end time apostle has explained, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, the, one of the first things the beast is going to do is commence round three of world war and he's going to do it. Well, the first thing he's going to do is going to be a surprise attack on all of the cities of the United Kingdom and later that same day or the next day all of the cities of the United States. So UK, you guys, are, we're doing PM service to the UK this morning, AM from the US. You got, According to God's end time apostle, you get it first. Well, you're over there where they fire them from. from the, you know, they only take a half hour, hour to hit, the, hit you with the missiles. The missiles have to fly four or five hours to get to the United States. Um, so even if they fire them all off at the same time, they hit you first and then later, and you're ahead of us on the clock. So depending on mid midnight on the Roman calendar falls, either later that same day or the next day on the calendar, boom, and a few hours after you've got it because the missiles have to fly further, the United States cities get it. All of that in fulfillment of a prophecy by God in Ezekiel, chapter 6, verse 6, saying, Joseph, 
your modern day your, your your modern day descendants, the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim in the United Kingdom, Manasseh in the United States, if you don't repent of your disobedience to God, which you stiff necked, rebellious, obstinate sons of ancient Israel today, still stiff necked, even worse. You won't. He won't. The two sons of Joseph won't repent. And so God will have to inflict the punishments he announced in prophecy through Ezekiel. One third of your people will die from the sword, the second seal of revelation, the seal of war, you know, and the, today the sword is not actual physical swords, but these nuclear warheads on missiles. Another third will die from the third and fourth seal, the seals, the black horse of famine, the fourth seal, pale, ho pale horse of disease epidemic, which those things follow, uh, famine and disease epidemic, follow the sword in war, because the, especially nuclear war, where the radiation, the explosions will kill a third of the people direct, but will kill another third because of the radiation, the fallout from it, that will destroy, radiate the water, destroy a lot of the agriculture and food. Just be in the air. You breathe it, <clears throat> and you get sick. You won't have food to eat. Your water that you may have will be contaminated, radiated, full of radiation. And so another third will die from the third and fourth seal. God explains this in Ezekiel. The third who remain alive, excuse me a second. All right, I had to clear my throat for those of you listening by podcast. <clears throat> uh, the third that remain alive will be taken captive. And, oh yeah, they may be put into concentration type camps here in the U.S. first, but they'll be transported over to the old holocaust facilities and buildings of Europe that have been preserved museum style for now but they're going to be used again like they were used before for the modern day descendants of the sons of Joseph Ephraim the United Kingdom Manasseh the United States you'll be in the the third who remain alive will be captive just like the Jewish people were they'll be captive as slaves in the holocaust buildings still preserved from World War II for the time after the beast commences, recommences World War in round three at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. But that'll be done under the hand of a German, a Syrian, German or Australian, descendant of one of the old emperors as beast of the revived seventh and final Holy Roman Empire. All right, that's where things are headed. So we don't need to fear Russia. Now, God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong is going to explain that, and we're going to play the first of a series of Russia in prophecy. And I may try to add scrolling text to it and continue this on the Bible study next Friday night and next Sabbath. And um, of course, we'll, I may pull excerpts out of that and use some of it during World Watch during the week because of what President Putin. So. Uh, suddenly and uh, um, amazingly um, and with spoke out boldly about all these missiles that Russia has aimed at the United States and how invincible their missiles are that no air defense system of the present or the future he said can attack them I'm going to play that again Sunday night uh, and on World Watch, God willing, we're able to be on Sunday night again. All right, let's go now to God's end time apostle with Russia in prophecy. I'm going to switch, uh, I have to go over here to do this. I'm going to switch the uh, uh, lower third to saying Mr. Arm put Mr. Armstrong's name up here. He's going to be speaking in this, it's an older radio program, Russia in Prophecy. So, let's see, I think I hit this button to bring this full screen, and here, here is God's end-time apostle, Herbert Armstrong, 
with the first in a series on Russia in prophecy. And greetings, friends. This is Herbert W. Armstrong with the good news of the world tomorrow. Now, for the past two or three weeks, we've been going through the prophecies. What's going to happen to the United States? But I think we're all very much concerned also about what's going to happen to Russia. So now let's come to the prophecies of Russia. We've been again again to a lot of prophecies of what is going to happen to the United States. We have seen that there is to be a yoke on our neck, and we've seen that it is not Russia that is going to put it there. And we have seen that there is going to rise up in Europe an assembly, a union of ten nations. It's going to be a resurrection of the ancient Roman Empire in the territory of Europe and around the Mediterranean. It's going to absolutely startle and dumbfound the nations and the people of this world. When this thing comes, as you read in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation in your Bible, that is, all whose names, as it says in that prophecy, all whose names are not written in the book of life. They're going to be absolutely dumbfounded because it's the thing that the world today least expects. Now, I've shown you that in this time of trouble to come, the great tribulation, Jesus Christ prophesied in Matthew 24 that there would be a time of trouble such as had never happened before since there was a nation, and never will again. And except those days should be shortened, that no flesh could be saved alive. In other words, it is a time when mankind has proceeded along scientifically and technologically to the place where he has invented such mass destructive measures, such powers of destruction that at last it becomes possible to blast human life off the face of this earth. Now, in the very past few years, for the first time, our scientists are telling us that that is now possible. And we have already had the warning that it is now possible to lay waste an entire continent, not just a town, not just a city, but an entire continent, and without warning. That is not possible. There has never been such a time before. Now we read in Daniel, in Daniel the 12th chapter, that at the time of certain things when this same power in Europe is going to actually take over the land of Palestine and half of the city of Jerusalem and set up the palace of his tabernacle over there, that at that same time the archangel Michael will stand up for our people. And then there's going to be a terrible time of trouble among nations such as has never happened on the face of this earth until that same time. Never happened before, never will again. Well, that's the same time that Jesus Christ was talking about. There can't be two times of trouble, each of which is greater than the other. And then we have seen back in the 30th chapter of Jeremiah that at that time there is going to be a yoke on our neck. And that that same time of trouble is the time of our national trouble in the 30th chapter of Jeremiah. It's a time so great that there is none like it and never has been, and it's the time of our national trouble, and there is to be a yoke on our neck. Now, we turned back to see who's going to put that yoke on our neck into the 47th chapter of Isaiah, remember? We've gone into this so many, many times. And uh, back here, we found about this Babylon, but it is the virgin daughter of Babylon. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, Isaiah 47. Now, let's pick it up. I want to identify uh, the uh, people being spoken of here in these prophecies once again. This is not the Babylon of Jeremiah's day or Isaiah's day. This is not the ancient Chaldean Empire, 600 years before Christ. This is the daughter of that Babylon. And this says, O virgin daughter, that Babylon was always spoken of in the male gender. This one is spoken of in the female gender. A daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Now, verse 5, sit thou silent, get thee into the darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. A woman now. Now, here is a woman, a lady, who is a lady of kingdoms. In other words, a woman ruling over nations or kingdoms. Then God says, I was wroth with my people, I polluted mine inheritance, that's Israel, and given them into thine hand, the hand of this daughter of Babylon now, in our time and our day, and thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient, that's Israel, hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. Now there is the power that is to lay the yoke. We've covered all of that ground. And thou saidest, verse 7, 
I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to heart, and neither didst remember the latter end of it. Now then, if you will turn over to Revelation 18, we saw these same identical things mentioned over here, Revelation 18 and verse 7. We've gone into this before. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. Here's a woman. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. And therefore, the next verse, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God that judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication live deliciously with her. Now here is a lady committing fornication with the kings of the earth. Here is a woman, a lady, ruling over the governments of the earth. And in verse 4, God has said to his people, our people, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. The Bible definition of sin, my friends, is the transgression of the law of God. Now then, in the 17th chapter of Revelation, you find this lady, this daughter of the ancient Babylon, described. In the first verse, here comes one of the angels with one of the seven last plagues that are her plagues that God is going to pour on her, her judgments. All right, here's one of these seven angels that had the seven vials, and he talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee, speaking to John, who wrote it now. John is seeing this in vision, and in vision he sees this angel, one of the angels that had one of the seven last plagues, saying to John, who wrote it, and John is not the revelator, John is merely the recorder who recorded it, but saying, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many walkers. Now here is a great woman, but she's a fallen woman, called by a very ugly name, an immoral name. And she is, of course, speaking spiritually, she is spiritually immoral. Now, here is a great woman that sat upon many waters, and verse 15 says, The waters which thou sawest, where the fallen woman sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. In other words, this woman sitting over many nations. Now read right on. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Now this is the same lady that is spoken of in Isaiah 47, the daughter of that ancient Babylon. Now let's get the identification. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Spiritual fornication. They're drunk spiritually. A man drunk physically doesn't see clearly physically. Everything is out of focus before his eyes. Maybe he sees double, but he doesn't see things in a sharp, clear focus. Everything is all fuzzy. It's all hazy. It's all out of focus. He doesn't see clearly. Now, my friends, when you're drunk spiritually on spiritual wine, your mind is blurred up spiritually. You can't see spiritual truth. You just can't understand the Bible. It doesn't seem to make sense. Well, that's what people say today. The whole earth is like that, you know. Uh, our author uh, who said the Bible is the book that nobody knows. I, Christ is the man that nobody knows. Uh, Bruce Barton it was. The book that nobody knows. Now, here this woman has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. The inhabitants are drunk. In other words, the people of the whole earth have been deceived. This is a deceiving power. It is a power of Satan the devil. Satan has deceived all nations. They're honest. They're sincere people. Yes, they're good people. As good as human nature because there's good in human nature as well as evil. There's a lot of evil in it too, and it's in every one of us. And we need to look down into God's spiritual mirror and see the dirt that's on our hearts. There's plenty there in every one of us. Unless God has washed it away by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's there. So, verse 3, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman, now here's this woman, sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Now this beast, my friends, are the civil governments with whom this woman has been committing spiritual fornication. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Purple is the color of royalty, the royal purple, and scarlet, the color of a harlot, a fallen woman. Decked with gold and precious stones and ornaments, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And her fornication is that she has this relationship with the kings of this earth. And upon her forehead was a name written. Now listen, who is this woman? Here's her identity. Here's her name. Listen. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon. Why, her name is Babylon. This is a female Babylon. This is the daughter of the ancient Babylon. Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Why, my friends? She has carried the same philosophies. She has carried the same practices. She has carried the same religious practices and the same doctrines as the ancient Babylon right down to this very end time. Now, here is something to appear. And with this beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, I've shown you, my friends, before 
that I think that every, well, I, I would think that every kind of church or denomination that is Christian or goes by the name of Christian, that is called Christian and claims to be Christian in the Western world, holds to the position that this beast here is the ancient Roman Empire. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now let's go a little further. The ancient uh, Babylon did fall. And that was the type of the fall of this modern daughter of that Babylon. Ancient Babylon fell. Ancient Chaldea, the Chaldean Empire, fell and was conquered by the Persians. God saw to it that they fell. God gave them that kingdom. In uh, the second chapter of Daniel, you will find that the prophet Daniel stood before the king Nebuchadnezzar of that ancient Babylon 600 years before Christ. And he said, the God of heaven hath given you a kingdom and power and strength and glory. You are this head of gold. God gave you your kingdom. But he wouldn't believe it. He admitted that God existed, but he never would surrender to the government of God. He never would acknowledge that God rules. He continued to think that he ruled, and so God limited his kingdom. And then that of his son. You remember the handwriting on the wall of Belshazzar. And his kingdom was numbered, and he was killed that same night. He died that night. And so God saw to it that the kingdom passed over to the Medes and the Persians. And the Persian Empire appeared on the scene and dominated the world. It was the greatest empire in the world. But they wouldn't acknowledge God's government either. And so in due time along came Alexander the Great and conquered them. And then the Grecio macedonian Empire was set up. But in the meantime, Rome was beginning to grow in the west. And Rome was coming along farther east and gobbling up more and more territory all the time. And, of course, the old uh, Macedonio-Grecian Empire was divided into four divisions after Alexander's death, and one by one, the Roman Empire began to come, that is, Rome began to develop into an empire, it just swallowed up one by one, those four divisions, until it dominated the world. Now, you see, it was the successor, this Roman Empire was the successor, politically, as so far as civil government is concerned, of the ancient Babylon. Now, here is this modern Babylon, the whole system is called Babylon, but here is a woman tied up with this Babylon. The Babylon is in the male gender. The Babylon is the father, and the great fallen woman pictured here is the mother. Now then, verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, that's the ancient Roman Empire, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It's going to be resurrected. That's coming in our time. Now, we have seen that it is yet to come. That is coming. It's a prophecy. It's going to happen. It isn't here right now. It's the beast that was and is not. It isn't now. And yet it is because the germ of it's there and it's going to rise. Now listen. It has seven heads. The seven heads are seven mountains. And the mountain is the symbol of a nation. Seven nations are seven dynasties of government on which the woman sitteth. Now there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is and the other is not yet come. And I've given you the names of them repeatedly on this program. And there is one more yet to come, and it's forming right now in Europe, if you have the eyes to see, if you can understand world conditions, and you can't understand world conditions unless you understand Bible prophecy, because one-third of your Bible is prophecy, and it outlines world conditions. It tells what's happening and what's going to happen and the cause of it. God Almighty rules. He rules over the nations of men. Men don't know it today. Men won't acknowledge it today. They're going to have to acknowledge it. Herbert W. Armstrong will return in a moment. But first, this offer concerning literature of related interest. The Middle East is a seething cauldron. The constant domestic upheaval and war holds the ever-present danger of oil cutoffs. How will another oil stoppage affect the U.S. economy and our standard of living? When oil production stops, how far will nations go to obtain the oil they need? Important events are prophesied for the United States and Europe as a result of conditions in the Middle East. It's time we understood the vital factors that have led up to this world crisis and what is foretold to happen next. Request your free copy of The Middle East in Prophecy. And friends, that's available online, and I'm just cutting into that for a moment because we're not supposed to be running the uh, address or phone number that's announced and let me, we'll, we'll come right back to Mr. Armstrong as soon as that finishes. W. Armstrong. Okay, they're announcing the address, and we've been asked to just not play that part of these broadcasts, and we're trying to cooperate with that. And uh, they, again, this booklet is available online. You can Bing or Google search for it. You can find a link uh, to those things from our library on cogtv.org. Now, there were ten horns on this last head, the same as there were the seven heads on the beast. The seventh head had ten horns on it. The ten horns that thou sowest are ten kings. You see, the horns are symbols. The heads are symbols. 
The heads are symbols, there are seven mountains, that's a symbol. But always you find in the Bible, it explains it itself in the Bible, that a mountain is the symbol of a kingdom or a government or a nation. Now the ten horns, there are ten kings. Kings and kingdoms are used synonymously in these prophecies. The kings or kingdoms which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, that's a very short time. So they're dictators. They, they don't inherit their kingdom from a previous dynasty or from a father on back, so they are dictators. These have one mind, shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is king of kings and lord of lords. The Lamb Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He is and will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords only and not until his second coming. When all the kingdoms of this world, it is pronounced in the 11th chapter of Revelation in your Bible, shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Now I want you to notice, these are only going to last a very short time. And... These make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is King of kings and Lord of lords. But they are only going to continue a short space. They're going to have power one hour, very short space with the beast. It doesn't mean a literal hour. It means a very short time. I've seen some people try to figure it out on the day for a year basis to 15 days. Well, they will have that power longer than 15 days. Every prophecy indicates it and makes it plain. But it will be a comparatively short time. I will say this. It will not be over seven years now. And I'm not trying to set the exact time, but it will not be over seven years. Now, they're only going to last a short time after the resurrection of the Roman Empire. They are going to fight Christ at his second coming. They will last then not more. That is, they will come into existence not more than, we'll say, approximately seven years. Supposing it should be a very, very little more than that, it'll be a very short time prior to the second coming of Christ. So, you see, it is yet future. It has not yet happened. Now we have this Babylon, and the whole system, as a matter of fact, my friends, listen, in a larger sense, this modern Babylon, this daughter of the ancient Babylon, is symbolic of our entire Western way of life and civilization today. Now, I'm not speaking of what we call our American way of life in contradiction to the way of life they have in Europe. I, I mean something broader than that. I'm not speaking even that specifically. But there is a general way of life that we have that we call our modern civilization today in our entire Western world. And the whole thing, my friends, is merely patterned after and is copied after the ways of the ancient Babylon. And even prior to the Babylon that we call uh, Babylon, the Chaldean Empire named after its capital city, Babylon, there's the old Babylonia way back before that. And it really goes clear back to the ancient Babylonia, and it goes back to the civilization that was started by Nimrod, who you read of in the 10th chapter of Genesis in your Bible, and his wife Semiramis. And there's a great deal in the annals of history of various nations about her. She is the original Venus. She is the original that called herself the mother of God. She is the original Easter, believe it or not, that set herself up as a pagan deity and had the people worshiping her way back there, hundreds upon hundreds of years before Christ, way back in ancient history. That was the very beginning. And my friends, out of those roots have our modern civilization more or less developed. I tell you, my friends, we need to wake up. We don't realize why we do the things we do today. We don't know where our modern customs came from. You can go to any library. You can look it up in a history, an encyclopedia. In your library, you can check these things. Why is it people won't check the truth? You know, the truth isn't always present, uh, always pleasant, I mean. It is usually present, I guess. <laughs> that was a slip of the tongue, but it isn't always pleasant. And so we don't like to face it. We want to believe what we want to believe, not what is always true. Now, you just go to the library and you check up on some of these things you believe. Why do you believe in Christmas and New Year's and Easter, for instance? Go to the libraries and check up or write in for our booklet on Christmas and New Year's if you want to, and that'll show you where to check up. But you go to the library and check up and find out whether this is verified and whether it's true. But you read both before and after and all around it and be sure it is true. You better get a little experience in research and learn how to study because a great many people seem to have never done it. It seems, my friends, people don't want to use their minds. I've heard of a lot of lazy people. I've seen a lot of them. I've had to deal with a lot of lazy people. 
But we think of people that are lazy as physically lazy. Listen, for every man that's physically lazy, that doesn't like to move his hands and arms and work with his hands or something, I want to tell you there are at least 100 people. For every one of those, there are another 100 people that are lazy mentally. They just don't want to think. They hate to use their minds. The one thing that God gave you that lifts you above an animal, my friends, is a mind. And God gave you your mind to use. Why don't you people use your minds? Let's begin to use them. Now, I'm, I'm not mad at you. I'm just in earnest, that's all. I, sometimes, you know, I think the way I preach, the way I uh, say these things, some of you people think I'm really angry at everybody. No, I'm not. I'll tell you, though, if you're going to know the truth, it's disillusioning. When I was a young man, 16 years of age, ambition was awakened in me and a desire to try to make something of myself, a, a thirst for knowledge, and above everything, the one thing that I wanted, the one thing I craved, the one great desire of my heart and my life was to have understanding. I wanted to just understand. You know, my father used to say when I was a little boy, five years old, I can remember it yet. I was only about five years old. And my father used to be very uh, provoked with me. And uh, he said to me, and I was a little boy, he said, Herbert, when you grow up, I'll tell you what you're going to be. You know what I thought I'd be? What I wanted to be? I wanted to be a streetcar motorman. You know, they had just gotten rid of the old horse cars about that time, and they had the first electric streetcars, and they were little bitty cars, too, those little dinkies we used to call them, I remember. You ask any little boy five years old, and he'll have some funny ideas what he's going to be when he grows up. Well, of course he never is. But I'll tell you what my father said I'd be. He said, Herbert, he said, you're going to be a Philadelphia lawyer when you grow up. He said, you can ask more fool questions than any boy I ever knew. I always did have an inquiring mind. I wanted to know all about it. I asked why and how and whether and everything else until my father got so tired answering my crazy questions. Well, I got information that way. Well, I wanted understanding. And especially after I passed age 16, and I used to go to the libraries. I used to spend my time back in the books of uh, philosophy and the philosophy division and and I, I used to love to read Socrates and Plato and Epictetus and, and uh, some of the ancient philosophers. I, and I could see that they weren't exactly right in their thinking, too, quite often. So I asked for understanding. And when I uh, came to know enough to really ask God for something, I didn't ask for wisdom like Solomon or just knowledge. There is a difference. I asked for understanding. Well, now, God gave me a certain measure of it. I won't brag at all about how much, but he did give me some. And I learned this, that the more understanding you acquire, the more disillusioned you're going to be. And listen, my friend, let me give you a little warning, because I've had a lifetime of going through this. I asked God for understanding. He gave it. If you ask him for it, he'll give it to you. But listen, don't ask God for understanding unless you first ask him for a great deal of tolerance and the kind of love that can come to a still broader understanding to understand people and have a lot of tolerance for them because you're going to be disappointed in people when you come to really have understanding. Now, a lot of people in this world go around, they make a fetish and almost a, a religion of wanting to trust people. Well, the Bible says, put not your trust in people. Don't trust any man. That's, that's what your Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you to trust God, believe in God. But what does the Bible teach you to do with men, your fellow men? It's what we don't want to do. It's have love for your fellow man. Have charity for him. You know, he needs it, and you need it from him, because there's plenty wrong with you, too, and you need a lot of charity from your neighbors. You see, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's the great commandment. But, you know, we think, no, I would rather trust my neighbor than get mad at him when he disappoints me. Now, I'm just getting down now to uh, where Russia comes in. I wanted to establish this Babylon... And this is the Babylon that's coming. Well, I can just uh, go a little further. I wanted to get a little bit here in the 47th and 48th chapters of uh, Isaiah first. Now, notice here, for instance. Uh, let's read on to verse 11. Thou saidest, I shall be a lady forever. This is this Babylon now that is to put the yoke on Israel. So that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart neither didst remember the latter end of it. Therefore hear this now, thou that art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee. Now listen to what God says to this Babylon. These two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. And they shall come upon thee in their perfection for a multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. 
for thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me thy wisdom and thy knowledge that have perverted thee, he says to this modern Babylon now. Thou saidest in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. They have even rejected God and made God out of themselves. Therefore shall evil come upon thee, and thou shalt not know from whence it riseth, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off. Desolation shall come upon thee suddenly when thou shalt not know. And that desolation and that thing is coming on this newly revived Europe that is coming up. It's coming from Russia. And I'll have to show you that in the next program because time is up now. If you want to know where Russia is going to march and when and what's going to happen, be sure to tune in at this program every single day at either this same time or the announcer will announce a different time. Now remember that booklet, United States and Prophecy. You can't understand prophecies without it. And the plain truth, get your name on the mailing list for the plain truth. Just first tell me the call letters of your station and there's no charge. And send your request and... All right, friends, and we'll cut out right there because he's about to give the address and uh, Plain Truth is no longer being published, although the Plain Truth magazine is uh, available on uh, a lot of places on the Internet, all the old issues of it and, and, and a lot of stuff. So, um, all right, I'm going to back up something that will enable us to sing a hymn as we go out of here. And I did mention to you that um, I was at the I was going to mention to you what's happening on the Northeast and I've got an update on that right here. Uh, it's been over a million customers have lost electrical power on the uh, Northeast. You know today we all depend on that electricity to run our stuff in our houses, our heaters, our well maybe maybe some of you use gas but uh, we use a lot of thing, electricity for a lot of things, maybe cooking and just the comforts of the day. Over 3,000 flights, 3,300 flights have been canceled in the Northeast. Uh, of that million, of more than a million power, electrical customers who've lost their power, 440,000 of them are in Massachusetts. Virginia had at least 301,000 over 301,000 and uh, Washington DC area counted over 154,000 people without power electrical power uh, Massachusetts is taking the brunt of the storm which hit yesterday on Friday and is not expected to ease up until middle of the day today on the Sabbath on the East Coast so about the time our live stream is going that's when it's about to be easing up. They've called it uh, Bomb Cyclone is the name they've given to it, ripping through the East Coast. And, uh, you know, that, that uh, began from the East and swung in a big cycle over, th over Europe and then, of course, spread all the way over the Atlantic Ocean to the East Coast of the United States. And... Here, where I am in the south, in Alabama, we're feeling the effects of it here. I felt the cold come in last night. We lost power here for a few hours last night. So I have some emergency uh, uninterrupted power supplies for some of the things I keep on overnight, but it only lasts for so long, and so they dropped out on us. So we were out for over a couple hours. My electrical clocks were off this morning I had to reset those I have some that operate on battery power and get their time from uh, Colorado from the military uh, base in Colorado that sends out a signal that gets most for the most part over the entire United States for setting these automatic radio controlled clocks they call them all right, so we covered, uh, but brethren in the Northeast may well need our prayers, being without, not only without power, but with all that snow and cold and rough weather around them. Um, I know prayers, I've seen Michael Nielsen go in and out of the hospital this week. Michael Nielsen from Texas, his wife Debbie, uh, doing her best to work and take care of her husband. They both will need our prayers, Michael and Debbie Nielsen of Marshall, Texas, and then there's Cat 
Kathleen Williams here in Birmingham who's <clears throat> been put against her will into a nursing home and where she's being not allowed to see any brethren have services on the Sabbath <clears throat> and she's uh, being forced to take drugs that she tells them she doesn't want to take and they're they're forcing them on their on her the mind dulling doing permanent ba brain damage drugs I'm doing what I can there's a little more I understand this week I'll be able to attempt to do we'll sure appreciate your prayers about that for God to guide and lead me exactly what to do timing how to do it and in the meantime be praying for Cat Kathleen Williams nicknamed Cat known by and loved by many many brethren in Alabama especially in the Birmingham area where she was born and raised and attended services since uh, sometime in the 60s mid to late 60s and um, <clears throat> Brethren, we're going to wrap it off there. We'll be continuing with Mr. Uh, next the next part. Part two sounds like it's going to be very good. And if God willing, I'll try to get some scrolling text going along with it. Uh, a lot of things i got to fix here. God help me get them fixed and just buckle down and do some of these things for you as a service. Uh, following uh, the hosting that started under Robert Collins for Sabbath services on the weekend and the nightly news related to the Bible and prophecy Sunday through Thursday nights on worldwatch.tv. We'll try to get that live signal going again as soon as we can. That may be April. But in the meantime, we're thankful we're able to function on Facebook Live opening up live video streaming. And it looks like our signal's going okay there. All right, watch out for that woman who's going to crown... After ten leaders give their power to one dictator, one new emperor, she has the false prophet providing a leader from the Vatican is going to crown that seventh and final head of the Holy Roman Empire. That's where all this is leading. Next series by Mr. Armstrong, Russia in Prophecy, will give more detail as to why we're going to want to watch out for the United States of Europe and Russia will probably continue to be an enemy of what becomes the United States of Europe, who will maybe take over those missiles, as I mentioned earlier, that President Putin announced on Thursday this week. Uh, he has aimed at 100, over 131 major cities of the United States and all of the United States military bases and facilities inside the United States. A lot of missiles. Boy, they've been busy, and they've been paying for them by selling gas and oil to Europe, a resource that their country has, their huge, large country has, and they've been quietly behind the scenes producing all these missiles. All right, friends, uh, let's see. I mentioned people that we can be praying for. I mentioned especially the situation for brethren on the northeast today with that storm, that cyclone cyclone bomb storm that blew in yesterday on Friday and put over a million people out of power, electrical power. Of course, you know, we got power from God's throne we can draw, draw on, but electrical power for their homes and canceled over 3,000, over 3,300 flights in and out of the northeast area of the United States. That's going to have an economical impact. It's certainly going to have a functional, dysfunctional impact on business and a lot of things. So uh, that'll have some effect upon us. So prayers for brethren, especially important. Yeah. All right. Let me sign us off. I don't want to sit by the too close to this woman for too long here. This woman that represents the false prophet and the beast that we're watching for to come. And, you know, that's just one of those things that's going to have to happen before Christ returns. Two and a half years of great tribulation. And, um, uh, tell you what, I'll back, I'll, I'll get her off the screen for a moment. I'll back this up to where we have um, this chart that we're watching for the fifth seal, the great tribulation to come. And I'll, I'll, um, but there's seven seals in all, and I think it'll fit better if I 
push this this way. And so, brethren, thanks for joining us for this Sabbath service for this 12th day, or I'm sorry, the 16th day of the 12th month, with less than four weeks to go now to the Passover foot washing memorial on the 14th day of the first month, March 20, evening of March 29, right after sunset, March 29, this year, 2018. Thanks for joining us for the Sabbath service. Until next time, friends, either on World Watch TV Sunday night or next Friday night at the Bible study, and then next Sabbath morning uh, here on Sabbath.tv, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert, wishing you a wonderful rest of the Sabbath day. Hope you have a little opportunity for some kind of fellowship <clears throat> with brethren and get in some good prayer and Bible, more Bible study with God, with, you know, and good prayers to God and thanks to him for our safety and during this time of being scattered, we have some means electronically to stay in touch with one another. That's kind of nice. Till next time, Stephen Lawyer Gilbert. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom, every everybody.